at another draft science video presentation. Oh, the camera's a little crooked, I think. Yeah. Kind of dark, but you can deal with it. Um, so we'll play one of these uh, crass course uh, videos, PBS, blah, blah, blah. And just go through the terminology again. So again, the assertion will be made that there's somehow a distinction between momentum. Somehow momentum is a, some sort of fake thing. <laughs> that you always have to conserve even though theoretically how could you possibly conserve it if you actually create some sort of sound or noise or any of this stuff you really can't <laughs> okay um, and you're gonna lose energy to the normal things you lose it to uh, something will move in some other way it will deform uh, or it'll create heat which is energy against energy essentially you know it's just inside the object things are going opposite directions just creating activity that doesn't have a direction um, and so those won't be visible signs of energy but they will be detectable signs of energy and that's all this is ever about is what's detectable what we know is already there what we know if you do the experiment in a closed vessel that you know that the energy won't be created you won't create any energy and whatever transformations you go through, the energy will be transformed into other forms of energy, but it'll always be energy. It'll always be movement of something. Big thing moves, can move a bunch of little atoms, it can move electrons, it can move all kinds of things. Just like electricity in a wire is a kind of movement and it can cause turbines to spin and all kinds of things to happen. It's movement converted into movement, converted into movement, converted into movement. And movement is defined in terms of your energy based on the fact that you have to have an atom and you have to move it. The atom has a mass and you move it at a certain velocity. And that's the energy. There is no other equation. There is no half mv squared equation. You know, again, I've been through the history. It's a terrible history. It's just nonsense. And the fact that physics keeps defending it and arguing it and pretending it's some sort of a real conversation and hiding it inside of elastic and inelastic which all <laughs> all interactions have some bit of uh, inelasticity imperfection elastic just means you know if you say something's elastic you're really just saying it's perfectly elastic and everything else is just some other form of less than perfectly efficient um, and that's all there is there isn't any there isn't two kinds of interactions they don't fall into these categories with any kind of grace and any losses are losses of momentum any losses to the environment are not losses again they they keep using these words conservation of momentum when they don't mean conservation of momentum you can't make sound you can't make noise you can't <laughs> same thing you can't make heat you can't make any of those things and say I conserve the momentum and then in the next very next sentence say well I didn't conserve the energy though because a bunch of energy went into all these other things that I don't call conservation I mean it just doesn't make any sense you and I have explored the rules that govern lots of different moving objects so far. But physics isn't just about dragging blocks up inclines or... So again, the rules, and what are the rules based on? They're based on an understanding of the atomic structure. It's again, understanding the rules of gravity. You have to understand that, oh, well, they're, it's made out of electrons and protons, and the electrons and protons have to move. So the whole atom has to move. So you can understand that the rules have to apply to the actual physical reality. You can't just say there's a rule and then pretend you don't need knowledge of why there's a rule. There's a rule because there's a physical mechanism that makes things happen, a physical process that things have to go through. And the whole point is, is you don't understand that physical process at all because you think it's some sort of relativity thing. You don't even think something has to have actual momentum. Like I can have two things crash into each other and one of them didn't have to have actual velocity. That somehow they could both have some sort of synthetic relative velocities and that neither one of them has to have any real velocity. I mean, it's, it's just nonsense from the start. Astronauts floating in vomit comets. There are also collisions. And physics has a lot to say about collisions, whether it... Uh, apparently over the years, year, she's sort of gained some personality now. So now she's doing like the physics girl thing where everything has to be a joke and a... You know, because the audience listening to physics videos is so frickin' stupid. <laughs> right, so they have to behave like cartoon characters. Oh, it says Hustler. <laughs> what is that? Buy Hustler magazine? I don't know. 
Oh, he's a pool hustler. Yeah, well, that that was the word he used for that in 1913, you know. But since then, no, not so much. There's two billiard balls knocking against each other, or what happens when you fail at a Super Mario level for the 47? Says yeah. So they always have to add this. You know, so we have to we have to make it real for people. So you know, let's talk about video games that are really archaic. <laughs> yeah, cool. Like from the 80s. Time and throw your controller at the floor. Stupid lava sticks. To figure out what's happening when objects collide, we'll have to take into account two main qualities: momentum and impulse. Yeah, there's no impulse. What is it actually? They're throwing in some new word we have to learn. Impulse. <laughs> there's no impulse. This is just. This is just retarded. No, there's just momentum. That's all you need to know. You want to know energy equals momentum. I don't, you know, they should just spell momentum, E-N-E-R-G-Y. They should just spell it energy because it's just energy. Momentum is always energy. Energy is always momentum. You can't ever have something happen in the universe and you look at it and you say, that's energy. And it doesn't involve the momentum of things moving. They're how much mass they have and how fast the mass is moving. That's always energy always 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 they'll never give me an example of some example where that's not exactly what momentum is mass moving at a velocity the end done finished we have completed the discussion of what energy is it is momentum always 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 and there's no such thing as impulse we also discuss what physicists mean when they talk about center of mass. So again, that's also irrelevant. It really is irrelevant to the conversation. It doesn't mean anything. That just has to do when you generalize everything into a point particle. Because once something has a certain amount of force involved a bit with it, it'll, it's just like the Earth. It generalizes right into a sphere. And unless you're going to be insanely anal, you can just do the math based on the sphere. There's no point in sitting there saying, well, it's a little fatter at the center and a little shorter over here. No, there's no point in it because it won't make enough of a difference. And why that's important. And we'll have our old friend Sir Isaac Newton to help us out along the way. So again, this is all an obscenity against Newton, okay? This is just an insult to Newton. The acceptance of this silly kinetic energy formula, it's, a, it's an exact attack against Newton. It, was, it started as an attack against Newton. Nothing else. Entirely an attack against Newton. The foreigners, the non-English people, okay? <laughs> they invented it for explicitly the purpose of somehow undoing Newton's authority, making in England look weak and stupid, okay? It had absolutely nothing to do with doing good physics. It's complete rubbish physics. If Newton was alive today, he would hate your guts for slandering the hell out of him. Because this isn't his physics. It isn't his science. It's just a lie to try to say this is Newton. Newton says so. Newton wouldn't in any way believe this crap invented by his worst enemy in life. So again, it's just this theft of people's identity, you know, this, this, this complete stealing. It's like me inventing a religion and shoving Jesus into it because everybody loves Jesus. So I put Jesus in my religion. You're just stealing Newton for your own silly religious purposes. You're slandering him. Just like they slander Einstein with gravitational waves and the invention of, of entanglement. He invented entanglement to make you look like a fool. How did he know you would sit there and say, yeah, they are entangled? <laughs> you know, he was trying to make you look stupid and you were stupid enough to, to, to buy the whole rope, you know, to hang your intelligence with. Oh, we can do without this. Yes, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. Remember Newton's second law? That's the one that says that the net force on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. It right, now we're going to find out. She's going to say it. Uh, forget that. Acceleration is just velocity. <laughs> just your change in velocity from moment to moment. But at each moment, you have momentum. And that's the truth. And your momentum is changing. So while your momentum is changing, we call it acceleration. But it doesn't mean anything. It just means your momentum's changing. It doesn't mean you add up a whole bunch of momentums. You say, well, I had um, I have this much momentum now. And in five seconds, I'm going to have another bunch of momentum. And then five seconds after that, I'm going to have another pile of momentum. Let's just add all those up. That's what they're using F equals MA to do. They're using F equals MA as an excuse to add their velocities four times. Like, say, if their velocity is four, let's square it four times. 
their velocity is eight. Oh, let's square it eight times. You know, let's let's multiply it eight times. They're just pretending that f equals ma means you can square your your velocity. No, it doesn't. It's not what Newton intended. Nothing Newton ever wrote would ever confirm this. Newton would never say. Newton would never agree with one half mv squared. So let's just understand: it's not his formula, and it's not a, a rational derivative of f equals ma. It's not a rational derivative. It's an irrational derivative. Literally, that's what they're doing. They're saying, my momentum a second ago was four. Now my momentum is five. Now my momentum is six. And then my momentum is seven. So instead of just realizing all I did was increase my momentum, my velocity, they've decided, let's add, multiply them all towards each other. Let's add them all up. And pretend that your actual now, you have that much velocity. You have three plus four plus five plus six. No, you don't. You just have seven. All right, that's your end. Seven. Three, four, five, six, seven. Not three, four, five, six, twenty. Except that's not actually what Newton said. He really said that an object's so called quantity of motion was equal to its mass times its velocity and the net force. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so somebody in the comments made something that, oh, he said that. Yeah, she said it just now, too. So that's really what he said, okay? It's really about your velocity, and that's all that really matters. And when your velocity is changing, uh, yeah, that's interesting, but it, frankly, it doesn't mean anything to what your momentum is or your total energy is. The fact that it's changing is nicely interesting. It means you are gaining energy, but it doesn't mean that you're squaring the amount of energy you have. ...is equal to the change in that mass times velocity over time. In other words, it's the derivative of mass times velocity with respect to time. And if you... Uh, yeah, so again, it just means that it's changing. It doesn't mean you get to add them all up. So that's the part where they just made it too silly. You don't get to add up the, moment, the, the momentum. You just, you don't. You don't add up yesterday, then combine it with today, and then combine it with tomorrow and have a total of how much do I weigh, right? You don't say, well, I weighed 150 yesterday, so I weigh 150 today, and I weigh 151 tomorrow, and I add them all up and come up 450. That's what they want to do. But to calculate that derivative, you find that the net force is just equal to mass times acceleration. But putting Newton's second law in terms of mass and velocity introduces an... And so again, the only way acceleration matters to a force is it has to be a force that's being applied over time. Obviously, collisions don't really have to, anything to do with a force being applied over time by the very word collision. We came up with the word collision to actually describe circumstances where it doesn't happen slowly. It happens very fast. So your acceleration and deceleration really doesn't have anything to do with it. All that's really going to matter is where did your energy go? Did it go completely into the other object? Did you get some of it reflected back? That's all that's going to matter. It's not going to have anything to do with any timed equation. There's going to be energy in and energy out, and it really doesn't matter what happens, you know, in the interaction, frankly. I mean, of course it matters. There are physical rules to how those interchanges will happen, but you will not lose any energy. We will not gain any energy. You can't change anything. You just have to see where did all my pieces go aspect of motion that we haven't talked about yet. Newton didn't really give this aspect a name, but we will. It's called momentum. Right. So he didn't, he didn't name it. He didn't call it energy. He didn't call it something. He didn't say anything. But clearly everything he said indicated that he understood the universe runs on two things, mass and velocity. And those two things can be put into any kind of package. And every experiment he did, he did hundreds of experiments, like Newton's cradle. I mean, there's things named after him because he did the experiment so often. And he's clearly demonstrating that there's a certain amount of energy in, there's a certain amount of energy out. And in all elastic collisions where you get to see it, okay, and that's the difference. The more in, the less elastic the collision, the less you see the energy because it gets talked into little tiny pieces and ends up flying through the environment. But the more elastic it is, the more you, obvious it is. The more obvious there aren't any losses. You're reducing the number of losses and the momentum is cleanly going from one object to another object. So, you know, it's just obvious that Newton did not view the world as a world run by one half mv squared. It's absolutely nonsense to, to imply that this is Newton's formula or this is a derivative of Newton's physics. It's a derivative of a complete anti-physics, anti-Newton physics. 
and it's one of those things that's easier to see in real life than to describe. Momentum is often described as an object. Uh, the idea is to understand it and what we can, whether we can see heat or not see heat. We know we can take put a thermometer on it and we can detect heat. So we know we could put a thermometer in the clay. We know we can do two different things to be able to say, oh, but I lost more energy to heat in that circumstance. So there's lots of ways for us to understand where the energy went, to calculate it, to follow it. Um, and there is no such thing as any difference between momentum and kinetic energy. There's no, su there's no way you can have two kinds of energy. There's only one kind of energy. You only have so much of it. And it's just about mass moving tendency to remain in motion but technically it's an object's mass times velocity so a big bag full of leaves rolling down a hill it might be going fast but it doesn't have much mass so it doesn't have a lot of momentum right but by your your energy theorem it does have a lot of energy it has a whole bunch of energy and if I make a heavier thing and make it move slower, somehow I'll lose a whole bunch of energy and it will not hit the cat as hard, even though it's bigger, even though it has more torque, even though it has all kinds of things you can know it has, you can just pretend it somehow it doesn't have energy. The other the little bag of leaves has energy because it's light and it can go fast. I mean, it's just a stupid thing to believe. And it wouldn't be too hard to stop. But the boulder chasing Indiana Jones, that had a lot of mass and therefore lots of momentum. And no energy. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's all mass and very slowly rolling. And so therefore it's got no energy at all by your theory. By your theory, I can't generate, I can't make light bulbs burn. I can't do anything with all of that momentum. That momentum is dead momentum. It just has no power. And what I really need to do is make it two boulders half the size and going twice as fast. And therefore, I have so much more energy. So if I just keep breaking things into smaller pieces going faster, I somehow invent energy. That's what your theory says. That's what your formula says. It's obviously crap. And I don't know why I have to keep making these videos. I mean, clearly nobody's saying, yeah, Gary, you're right. I don't see any comments to say, yeah, Gary, I can kind of see the point. There's no way to rationally get around it. The energy theorem, the kinetic energy theorem has absolutely no value. It will never give you the right answer, so why use it? The only time it's safe to use is when you're doing something about energy in and energy out, and you never need to know the actual number. You know, as long as you don't need to know the actual number, who cares what kind of stupid number you put down? Oh, it's 75 joules. Who cares if you're not going to use them? So it would have been much harder to stop. And momentum is one factor that affects collisions between objects. After no, it's the only factor. That, <laughs> that There's no other factor. There's no such thing as a collision without a mass hitting another mass. Even a photon has to be conceded. It's got some sort of mass because it's moving. So you have to concede it's got mass because it has momentum. And so there is no such thing as any interaction that doesn't have mass involved. So you have to have the mass and the mass has to be moving or there's no such thing as a collision. One of them has to be moving, right? I have to run into the bullet or the bullet has to fly into my head. There can't be, it can't be any other way. It's either it has the energy or I have the energy or we both have energy, but it can't be that none of us has to have it. None of us is moving. That's not the right answer. If a huge boulder crashes into another huge boulder, that's going to be a very different sort of crash than if a bag of leaves crashes into a boulder. But the other quality of a collision that we often... So they really didn't do that experiment very well because the bag of leaves isn't moving any faster than the big boulder. So obviously, yeah, yeah, it's got less mass and it has the same velocity. So that isn't going to be much of an experiment. So she should have just pointed out, well, I could take all the energy of that big heavy boulder and I could convert it by rolling the boulder into a spring and then I could put a very small pebble on it and the very small pebble will go very very fast and then she could try to argue that the small pebble has much more energy than the big giant boulder did even though the same spring essentially it's, it's a representation of exactly the same amount of energy let's just pretend it has more energy because we say so because we are religious people and we just accept Lydnitz, uh, ludicrous squaring of the velocity for no good reason and then we figured uh, 70 years later we'll shove a half in front of it because it's too ludicrous and so we'll make it half ludicrous but it's still ludicrous it still doesn't make any sense it's still you can't use it and if you use it to land on the moon you won't land on the moon you'll crash on the moon consider is known as impulse which it all right so here we go what the fuck is that i would say at least in the context of physics doesn't actually have anything to do with willpower or yeah it doesn't have anything to do with willpower 
And it doesn't have anything to do with physics, frankly. It's a meaningless word. Or why you throw your game controller when you get stuck on a level. Instead, so more nonsense. Ed impulse, usually represented by a J, is the integral of the net force on an object. Over oh, the integral of the net force on an object over time. So that's the part where, let's, let's just add it, okay? Let's just add all of the punches together and say this is how much punch we got. Um, <clears throat> let's see how to say that. No, that would actually work. <laughs> okay, because they're, they're, they're actually unique individual events. Okay, but you can't add the velocity you already got. I got $5 yesterday, right? I, somebody gives me $5. Well, I'll say today, yeah, I got $5. Like, I got a new $5. Even though, no, it's the same $5. I have $5. And so I'll count, yesterday I got $5. Today I have $5. And I'll just count them as both being $5. And then I'll add another one for tomorrow. I'm going to have $5. And I'll just say I have, that's a new $5. And I'll say I have $15 because over three days I had $5. Every day I had $5, so that's three $5. That must be $15. That's exactly what they're doing. It's that stupid. All right. Uh, I have to go make my dinner and such. So I am able to pause now, I think. So this should, be, should work. We'll see what happens. It'll be a good test video. All right, we should be back. Let's see if it works. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Continuing. The time. In other words, it's change in momentum. Impulse turns out to be a particularly useful way to describe a crash because generally in collisions, forces change very quickly. So if a force. Right. <clears throat> so I did speed it up. Maybe I'll speed it down a little. Uh, because what? You know, let's be fair as we can. Uh, so again, this impulse thing, it doesn't have any specific meaning, it's not related to anything Newton said. Just a made-up concept that now we're going to disguise the events, you know, in some new language. And it's just trying to disguise something you already know. You already know there's a certain number of atoms moving. That's it. Now they can move. Yeah, I'll draw it. You know, this isn't... There's just no way to refute these basic concepts. There's just no counter-argument. And it's clearly they're just distracting you from the reality. So the idea is something has energy. Well, it just means it has stuff in it that can be moving. So if it's heat, the idea is it's just moving. Some of it's moving in the same, the op exact opposite direction, so you can't see it. And the idea is when something has momentum, is that what it contains, the stuff isn't fighting against each other, all of it, that it has an extra bit. Okay, that means it has extra going in one direction. So it has stuff going this way, and it has stuff going this way, and it has stuff going this way, but it has obviously more stuff in one direction than another direction. That direction could be any vector, but the point is, is it's more going in a direction. It just has to do with more pieces of mass moving in a direction. And because all of the mass bits are contained in the same object, right, you just take the net of the entire thing. You add up all of the bits, what they're doing, and you get a net out of that. And that's the momentum. And the momentum, like for the actual bits, they might be going a million miles an hour. It doesn't matter how fast the individual bits are going. You have to average it over all of the bits. And that'll tell you what its capacity. When it gets hit by this bit, this bit doesn't matter because it's going that way. This bit's going that way. This bit's going that way. The only ones that are going to matter are the ones that are actually going in the direction. And the fact is, it just happens to be more of them. And so the fact is, is when you interact with something, it's just like heat transfer. You're just transferring the heat. Except we know with momentum, there isn't some point where, you know, you get to a 5 temperature, and this is a 5 temperature, now you're equal. You know, you could start off as 10 and 0, <clears throat> and this will always keep 5. Well, we know in interactions where you're not transferring heat, but you're transferring momentum, that you can actually transfer all of it. You can give all of it to something. So you can have a spring that uncoils, and just when the spring reaches its full length is when the object leaves the spring. So the object doesn't leave the spring till the spring completely relaxes. Now, if the object leaves faster, well, some of the energy is not going to be able to get into the object, you know, because it's just just going to work out that way. It's good. The spring ain't going to move fast enough to catch up to the thing that's moving really fast. But you'd have to put a really, really light object on the spring for the spring to push it so fast that the spring, it'd have to be lighter than the spring. Yeah. You'd have to put an object on the spring that's lighter than the spring for the spring not to be able to um, convey its energy. 
But anyway, so that's a more technical. Look, this is all a little bit technical. You got, you got to <laughs> dig inside. You got to look inside the package, unwrap all this stuff. You got to take it apart. You got to unscrew the screws, and then you have some bolts, and then you have some stuff that's glued together. You got to pry everything apart and to get to the little the core of it. And the core of it is there's only one definition of your energy, and that is how much matter do you have moving in a net direction. The end. The other stuff all cancels out. All the cancelizations, you, you can't, you know, if you add up, you've got, well, there's one going this way, I have to account for it. Oh, there's one going this way, I have to account for it. So you add it all up, and what's the net? The net is your momentum. That's what you can do when you hit something. You have a certain preponderance. That is, you have more going one way, so you'll hit it more that way than some other way, the opposite way. It's that simple. And all the others are balanced out. All the others undo each other's effect. This is, this is so basic. It just, it's really, just shows how broken physics is that they don't understand that simple concept. If smacks into a wall and over the course of half a second is force on the wall in Newtons is equal to the time multiplied by 25. So again, in Newtons, why not just put it in, you know, it's a real force, it's a real amount of energy, so why not just say in joules, in watts, in all horsepower, in lots of things. It's a certain amount of energy it hits the wall with. It has a certain amount. And the simple argument is because it's a basketball and a brick wall, well, most of it's going to get reflected. The brick wall is going to quickly rebound. So whatever hits it, it's going to compress a little, just like the earth compresses when you sit on it. You don't really see it dent, but it actually does dent, and it actually does push you back. Um, yeah, that's what the wall is going to do. So it's going to push back so quickly that the basketball is just going to fly off as if, as if there was just a nice, convenient U-turn in the energy. In a sense, there was just a U-turn in the energy. The energy went in. The brick wall rejected it because you can't move all the atoms, so the atoms just vibrated. They just went do do it and pushed right back, so that's all you get. You get a reflection of your energy. Energy in, energy back out. Pretty efficient. We'd say that its impulse was 3.1 newton seconds. Now let's consider the So so now she's calling impulse momentum. They were two separate words before. And now she's doing it exactly the same addition. And what you could say, you wouldn't you could just say it's thirty one joules. I mean the difference between a joule and a newton is basically the point is is that the, the joules is in kilograms and newtons is in tenths of a kilogram. Different kinds of collisions that we can study. Generally collisions can be described as either elastic or inelastic. And it's gonna be important to figure out which kind you're dealing with. So again it's just more playing with words. If you really dissect these two words, they really don't mean anything explicitly, coherently. It's all just a matter of how much the energy stays coherent in terms of its direction. So the more misdirection, that is the more you can convert the energy into heat or something that moves in some other direction, the more inelastic it is. And the less, the more resistant the atoms are to being moved in some other direction, the more they can't move in some other direction, the more elastic it is. Because the math works in very different ways. It's elastic collisions. So there's no separate equations. This is all just mush, you know, and it's all premised on some notion that there's kinetic energy and something called momentum, and somehow they're different things. And somehow they can be understood as different things. They can't be. They're both explicitly definitions of energy. Um, bouncy, that's because they are. Like the conservative systems we talked about last time, in elastic collisions, kinetic energy is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, you can't create or destroy energy by merely colliding things. <laughs> Again, it's just idiotic to think that was even a question. You can't destroy the energy, you can only convert it. And you can either convert it efficiently from one object to another, or you can convert it to the environment and move the object very little. Example. Just how efficiently you convert the energy. You knock a white billiard ball into a second red one that's sitting on the table, and they hit each other in just the right way. For this to be a true elastic collision, all of the kinetic energy from the white ball would have to be transferred. So, right by her own definition, it's impossible. Okay, you heard it. You heard the ball hit, and it made a sound. So we know it can't be perfectly elastic. 
because there had to be some loss of energy to make sound. So some energy went into the environment to make sound. So we already lost some of the energy. Now we might have also lost some because the ball skidded and you know there was some friction because of the skidding and the turning, right? The balls are turning a little bit as they're hitting. And so there's a little bit of torque that's probably also stealing some of the energy. So the fact is the red ball will leave a little bit slower and, and we can't do it perfectly. There's no perfect, you know, unless you go into outer space, um, you know, where you don't have atmosphere to steal some of the energy with sound and atmosphere to move. Again, I didn't even talk about it. the air molecules getting all jiggled around. So, you know, it can never be a perfect exchange. <laughs> so, so, and again, they use these wor words and they just play with the words. And then the next minute they'll say half the energy was lost. So they'll be completely, um, they don't give a shit about the details in one circumstance, in the next circumstance, they're just saying all oh, yeah, the other details is where all the energy went. It went into all kinds of heat and all the sounds and all kinds of things stole all the energy. I mean, it's preposterously stupid. Uh, to the red ball, meaning that after they hit each other, the white ball would stay put and the red one would zoom away with all the kinetic energy. So the same speed, basically, that the white ball used to have. But you won't come across elastic collisions in real life. Because there, there's... okay, so, so there's the simple statement. So why are you using this vernacular when it doesn't really happen in the real world? And that all collisions are just some degree of elastic, some percentage of elastic, some a percentage of efficient in transferring the energy. So it just means that it has a certain efficiency in transferring the energy. And the more inefficient it is, the more you call it inelastic. The more efficient it is, the more you call it elastic. But it's really just efficiency. So let's just change the, that language and just say you have efficient transfers and you have inefficient transfers. Just call it that. That, that would be real physics. Real physics would be to describe what's really happening, which is you can efficiently transfer the energy or you can lose a lot. <laughs> yeah. And the truth is, is that there's no kinetic energy formula that makes it rational for you to think you can conserve the momentum, that is efficiently transfer the momentum, but lose a whole bunch of energy. That can never happen. Always going to be some energy that's lost somewhere in the collision, generally lost as heat or sound. And when kinetic energy isn't conserved, that's an inelastic collision. There is one. So again, it's nothing about cons conservation. We know that the energy is always conserved. It always goes somewhere. So it's just silly to say there's no conservation of the energy because, of course, the energy has to be conserved. And if you're going to argue that energy has to be conserved, then you say, yes, momentum has to be conserved. But then it has to be a broad definition of momentum. It has to mean that you're not talking about how efficiently you transfer the momentum from one object to another object, then you're talking about how much momentum I created in electrons flying through the air, how much momentum I created in all the other superfluous ways that the energy could have leaked out. So you're just talking about the efficiency of the transfer. So that's all this subject is. So all this garbage rhetoric could just be replaced by efficiency of transfer, efficiency of energy transfer. That's it. That's, what the, that's, the, that's the subject, the efficiency of an energy transfer. One thing that's going to be true about every collision, whether or not it's elastic, the momentum of the system will always be conserved. It See, this is silly. It'll always be conserved. No, it, it'll always be conserved in both circumstances. You have to conserve it. The point is, is will you efficiently transfer it from one object to another object? And no, you won't. So again, she's arguing that there's this complete transfer of the momentum, and yet there's still losses to the environment. You can't do both. The energy that makes sound has to come out of your momentum. You have to lose the momentum from the first object that went in to the collision. The object that's dead can't give you any energy. So there's no source of energy to make the sound except the two objects and their momentum. I mean, this is so grammar school. I mean, it, there's just no excuse that I have to make these arguments be transferred to another object it might even be transferred to more than one object but the momentum is always going to go somewhere and we'll be able to use math to figure out where it went and, and the energy always has to go somewhere so again this is just silly baby talk energy is just is just as indestructible as momentum if you're going to say in the, to the entire universe but we're really talking about the energy leaving the system that you're watching, the system where you're transferring energy from one object to another object. You can't say, I successfully 100% transferred the momentum and then say, I also heated the environment. It's insane 
<laughs> it's preposterously silly. It can't happen. It's silly, stupid nonsense. Is what we know about impulse and Newton's third law to prove it. The third law, of course, is the one that says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And that All right. Now, I've already proven that to be kind of an overgeneralization and that you're really not the the there is no rule of actions and reactions like there's a reaction force. There's just you getting rid of a force, transferring it to something else. If I transfer what I have, you know, frogness. Say I have some frogness. I transfer the frogness to you, okay? It means, yeah, now I've changed because I don't have it anymore, and you do. But you wouldn't say I have anti-frogness. You wouldn't say I got some anti-thing or some thing acted on me. No, I got rid of something. And it went into you. Now, it could have gone into the environment. It could have gone to a lot of places, the frogness. But it happened to go into you. All right? That doesn't mean there's an opposite reaction. The, the action is me getting rid of it. There's no opposite reaction. <laughs> there's just me getting rid of it. Just like something that's hot gets rid of its heat. There's no opposite reaction. It doesn't get colder than cold. <laughs> you know, it just gets rid of the heat. The consequence of getting rid of the heat is it's colder. But there was no opposite reaction that made it colder. It got rid of heat. That applies to collisions in the same sense that if a ball hits a wall, it'll exert a force on the wall, and the wall will exert an equally strong force back on the ball. We can just All right, so it's not an equally strong force from nowhere. It's the same exact force. So again, that's the, the counter argument here is that you're not, you're not creating a new force. You're just reflecting the old force. Just like if, a, uh, if my light shines into a mirror, you don't say the mirror made new photons and shined back with equal photons. You know, no, it's the energy that went in. The photons that went in are just reflecting. Describe each of these forces as impulses, since we know that an impulse is just a change in an object's momentum. So the ball's momentum... So again, just more silly, r rubbish words to be using. Impulse is a change in the momentum. So that's the same thing as a collision. So why are we using this? Why are we adding this extra word except just to confuse people? It serves no purpose. Momentum will be decreasing when it hits the wall, but because of Newton's third law, we know that the wall's momentum is going to increase by an equal amount. The change. In so again, it's, it, 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 she's arguing as if the momentum of the wall actually changes, when clearly it doesn't. Because if it did, then the wall would actually move, and then it would have been had the you would have transferred the momentum. Clearly, you failed to transfer the momentum. That's why the, you're getting it back. It's because you, it failed to work. You failed to give the wall momentum. If you gave it momentum, there'd be nothing to bring it back. It would start moving, and it would keep moving in the direction. It's by Newton's law. It's going in a direction. You keep going. There's no other force to act on it. So if you successfully gave the wall momentum, it's not falling back. If I start the wall falling, it's not going to stop and go, oh, no, I'm not supposed to fall. It's not coming back. The wall's momentum might be impossible for us to see because the wall is connected to the ground and the earth has lots of mass, but it's there. And that fact that momentum is always... <clears throat> so she says it's there. No, it isn't there. All you created was a few little vibrations and atoms. And those vibrations didn't go very far and they just reflected right back out to the outside world. Most of the wall had no idea you hit it with the basketball. The, 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 the energy didn't go very far. And it just went into the local area of the wall, and the wall just threw it right back at the basketball. Well, technically, it didn't even have to do that because the basketball actually, actually compressed and stored the energy in itself. <sighs> but anyway, that's a whole other subject. Turns out to be super helpful for describing collisions using math. Like in the case where you knock the white billiard ball into the red one. Since momentum is conserved and momentum is mass times velocity, the white ball's mass times velocity before the collision has to be equal to the mass times velocity plus the red ball's mass times velocity after the collision. Which is why... So we know that doesn't happen though. That's why all the... Anything that's superfluous to it, any noise, any change in the, uh, the felt, any change in the external environment has to come out of the momentum. So it's just this lie that the, somehow momentum is a, a magical thing and it's completely 100% transferred no matter what you do. No. If you make any noise, if you heat anything, if you do anything to the environment to give it energy, it has to come out of your momentum. Assuming the balls have the same mass, if the white ball stops moving after the collision, then the red ball must move with the same velocity that the white ball had. So now we know about both elastic and... So as you just said, it has to move at the same velocity. No, it doesn't. 
So, I mean, that's only in a perfect environment where you didn't make any sound and whether you didn't move any air and where you didn't change the felt and where you didn't have any friction. So none of those conditions exist. So why are you saying it? Inelastic collision. But there's also such a thing as a perfectly inelastic collision because, of course, there is. And it's easier for me to tell you first what it isn't. So perfectly inelastic would have to be some argument that um, all of the energy gets converted into misdirection. That is, it gets converted into something that can't sh won't show, like heat. So all of the energy that's going this way, so there's a bunch of, you know, there's arrows going this way, a net amount of arrows. And all you're doing when you're saying, I'm going to make it a perfectly inelastic collision, is you're saying, I'm going to bend this one up this way, and this one down this way, and that one this way, and this one this way. I'm going to end up converting them all into directions that will end up over, overall just randomizing into just as many went this way, just as many went that way, just as many went this way as went that way. So I converted all the energy in one direction into an equal amount of energy in all directions. So heat will do that. So it is not a collision where the objects lose all of their kinetic energy. Instead, a perfectly inelastic collision is what happens when objects stick together. These collisions lose as much kinetic energy as possible to other forms of energy, like heat or sound or even potential energy. But still, the momentum is conserved. An example. So again, she said it again, the momentum is conserved. It just doesn't make any sense. No sense at all. You can't see any of the momentum. Was None of the momentum was transferred. So just like the energy, none of it was transferred. It was all converted into non-coherent movements. So movements that have no net um, direction. It was, so it was converted into energy in all directions, and therefore all the directions cancel each other out, and you get nothing. That's perfectly inelastic, which don't exist either. <laughs> so... <laughs> Just as there's no point in talking about a perfectly elastic, that is a perfect efficiency, there's no such thing as perfect inefficiency. It would be if you pushed one magnet towards another at just the right angle for them to stick together on contact, and then they both started sliding together at half. So that's very dangerous because obviously they're going to move towards each other. They're magnets, so they're attracted to each other. So you're, that adds energy to their movement so this is not even a good example to use because obviously you push the magnet at a certain speed as it's approaching the other magnet that's experiencing friction the two magnets are going to end up moving towards each other and the one you've already given velocity to is more likely to move because it's not stuck in the friction the speed of the magnet you pushed. Before the collision, the momentum of one magnet was zero, and the momentum of the one you pushed was its mass times velocity. Once the magnets collide, the mass is doubled and the velocity is... So we'll just pretend it's Velcro and it's not, you know, this less than perfect magnet sticking to each other stuff. So here's the formula, right? So there's two different formulas now, and we're supposed to make sense of this somehow. I don't know what this is. M2 V divided by 2. What? <laughs> yeah, I don't, why wouldn't these twos just cancel out? What is that? I mean, yeah, sorry, even on the face of that doesn't even make any sense. So P is momentum, it's called MV, and then they use the same two terms and put this superfluous two in here for no good reason whatsoever. Beats the hell out of me, but anyway. Cut in half. So the total momentum stays the same, but you lose some kinetic energy because there's less... All right, so once again, you can't lose any kinetic energy, you can't lose any energy at all. Okay, and conserve the momentum. That is, make a complete transfer of the velocities. So if you completely transfer the velocity mass ratio, the momentum, it's impossible for you to have lost any energy to the environment, any kinetic energy, any, any kind of energy. You can't do that. It's impossible. It's silly. It's nonsense. Why does anybody think that's possible? Why are all these people saying this stupid thing that can't be true? You can't 100% transfer the momentum and then say, but we toasted some bread and we lit New York City and we, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, wound a clock and we no, you charged my iPhone. No, you didn't do any of those extra things. If you did those extra things, then you didn't transfer the momentum. Then the velocity that the second thing leaves with is less than a perfect transfer. You can't have a perfect transfer and create energy on the side. 
speed involved. So that's the basics of how collisions work. And how so just absolutely horrible. It's not the basics. It's not good physics. It's absolute rubbish. This is as far as I played it, I think. So this will be all new to both of us. How they relate to the momentum of motion in a straight line. But there's one more detail we have to explore in order to really understand how objects move, whether they're going to collide or not. And that is the center of mass. Until now, we've been talking about objects as though they were little pinpoint particles. And that's worked fine for the most part, because the objects we've been talking about would act much like a small... So that's all nonsense, right? So nowhere in there was where point particles have anything to do with it. She wasn't talking about angular interactions. We were talking about head-on collisions. There was no point particle necessary. So again, just more jargon, more stuff they just make up. So they can't even do a narrative of their own narrative that's honest. They can't even describe the story they just told, honestly. <laughs> Dot wood. But of course, not all objects work that way. If you've ever tried to fling a hammer, for example, which I don't recommend doing, it wouldn't fly through the air in the same way a softball would because the hammer's mass isn't distributed evenly. Likewise, a pendulum with a big ball on the end of a very light string called a simple pendulum would behave very differently from a pendulum that uses a heavier stick, what's known as a physical pendulum. In these situations, it's more useful to... Uh, so now she's talking about bouncing or something? I don't know. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. A light string. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No to describe what the center of mass is doing. When you throw a hammer, for example, it's gonna rotate around its center of mass. So what is center of mass? It's basically the average position of all the mass in the system. Say you have a three meter long stick, which we'll pretend is mass. Right, so if you have 15 atoms, you take all the 15 atoms, and you find out what's the, the, uh, the spacing, and you just say how many inches from uh, each other are they, and then you find out the, where the middle is gonna be based on how many inches there are, are in total separation. And I'll tell you where the middle is with a two kilogram ball stuck on either end. It's easy to see where the center of mass should be. The mass is distributed symmetrically, so its center is gonna be right in the middle of the stick. Now let's say you have another three meter stick, and on the left side, there's a two kilogram ball, and on the right side, there's a four kilogram ball. This time, there's twice the mass on the right side of the stick. So when you're trying to calculate the average position of all the mass attached to the stick, you're going to be counting the right-hand side twice as much. That means the center of mass will be two thirds of the way along the stick, closer to the four kilogram ball. It's like each piece of mass pulls on the center of mass a little bit. Well, we know that it's gravity that's causing this effect. So you just have a big bucket catching gravity on one side and you have a small bucket on the other side. And you're just saying, where do I have to put the center of the balance to balance those two very different buckets? Da -da. So parts with more mass end up pulling harder and moving it closer. But if you don't want to calculate this in your head, and if there are like seven different particles to deal with, you probably won't. But there's an equation for it. First, pick a starting point to measure from, where x is zero. That can be the end of the stick, the middle of the stick, whatever's easiest, as long as you're consistent. Then the center of mass will be equal to the sum of each individual mass times its distance from the starting point. So that's what I basically just said. If you, All you got to know is the distances. Uh, if you take all the distances, it'll give you a final average distance. All divided by the total mass in the system. Let's try it for our stick with a differently weighted ball. So we'll choose the left side of the stick where the two kilogram ball is as our starting point. The two kilogram ball's mass times its position is zero. The four kilogram ball's mass times its position three meters is 12 kilogram meters. And the total mass of the system is six kilograms. So divide 12 kilogram meters by six kilograms and you get two meters. That's the position of the center of mass, which is two thirds of the way along the stick towards the four kilogram ball side. Exactly what we figured out earlier. I'm telling you all of this now because from here we're. He See, now that's really uninteresting, right? It doesn't have anything to do with theory or. Why, 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 why? Nothing to do with the why question. Obviously, if it was a four kilograms on each side, it would be right in the middle. Obviously, it has to go to one side or the other if I'm going to lower the mass. So clearly, there's only other one place to go, and that's halfway the half distance. Heading off in a totally new direction, literally. But for now, you learned about collisions and how momentum and impulse can be used to describe them. We also talked about differences between elastic and inelastic. So she made up this impulse crap. Okay, totally useless. Uh, momentum and impulse. So momentum and when momentum collides. And instead of saying, <laughs> you know, momentum that has significance by two different momentums interacting. The interaction of momentum. Instead of just saying that, even. We say impulse. No. Rubbish. All right, that's, that's probably enough, right? I mean, how many of these, you know, I just keep doing them, though. I'll, I'll, you know, I continue to search for somebody doing actual physical experiments. Now, I find a few, but they're not, they're not the experiment we need. Now, this is, you know, Khan Academy, and he's smashing a basketball into a blob of ice cream. So that's really stupid. <laughs> yeah, really, really stupid. But he says the same horse shit. You know, somehow 
Oh, oh yes, yeah. so if you if you conserve the momentum, it's called elastic, and if you don't conserve the energy, it's called inelastic. I mean, it's just completely different, wacky definitions. So just too silly, um, you know. And it goes, it goes on and on. So um, there's a guy who bangs in things, you know, on this air track. Now I was thinking, you know, this might be something worth getting one of these. Um, they have the kind that you put dry ice in, you know, these pucks. Um, you know, and then this one creates a vibration on a piece of paper that so it marks the, the, the things. But you can do it by putting, you know, a, a light on the pucks and then moving them and then taking a time-lapse photo. Different ways of doing it. But, but they're really just momentum equations. There is no, M, you know, one half mv squared isn't used in these simple momentum exp experiments. So, you know, there's what we need is the experiment that uses momentum and kinetic energy formula at the same time. That's the one we need, and that's the one they don't make, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the, even the simple spring experiments, there just aren't any. Um, they're all about some other bullshit. So this one is just banging two objects. Uh, he's banging one object into another and sticking them with Velcro. So again, we don't get the example of the opposite circumstance. You can only see some, we can only see a light mass turned into a heavy mass. We never see the heavy mass turned into a light mass and going faster. And that's the one we need to see. All right. So... Yeah, that's enough for now. But I'll keep looking, see what I find, and blah, 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 blah. It's probably enough. And I can always just pause, I suppose, and then I can decide if I want to add some other crap. But yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, decided to do a little add on. No, just because I can. <laughs> so I will. Uh, you know, just to try to clarify, try to make some sense for you people, try to get something understood. So we have just objects, we could have just these two different objects in the universe and say this one has three things in it and this one has six things in it. Atoms, mass, okay, so they have an inverse number, this has twice as much, okay, mass. And I just do something to either one, but let's say I do something to this thing and I shoot in something that has uh, 24 or 36, let's say, energy thing. But it's just one little piece of energy. I'm just shooting in a piece of energy. You sort of understand that all of these are going to become equalized to that piece of energy. So whatever that speed is, that speed is going to be transferred to all of these objects, and they're all going to end up with it. So if it ends up with being 6, let's say, right, <laughs> since there's 6 objects, Six here, six here, six here, six here, six here, six here. So 36 went in in terms of speed, right? And it's all going to just be converted, spread over all the mass. And now there's a six, okay? Six worth of velocity. They all got six worth. And they're all going to move together with that six. So I went from 36 to six, right? And then if I hit this with the six units, you know, of um, velocity um, times my six pieces doing the hitting, you can understand that it's six things hitting with six. So it's six hits, okay? Not one that has 36, but six hits that have six. <laughs> okay, so you can sort of understand that because there's six, okay, six, that means I'm gonna hit each one twice. And so this one will have six, and then it gets six more. That'll be, you know, 12. And then this one will have 12, and this one will have 12. You know, and I add those up, and I get my 36. So it's always 36. This doesn't have more energy. It just has fewer bits going faster. This has more bits going slower. This was a single bit going very fast. It always adds up, you know, if you convert the energy efficiently, it always adds up to 36. There's no, this has twice as much. This has, you know, 66 energy bits, you know, and this only has 33 energy joules. There's no such thing. It can't be. It's the same amount of energy. Momentum is energy. 
and you can either convert it if I don't convert it carefully right if I don't do it very efficiently and if a couple of bits go out here I lose two this way and I lose two this way well that's not going to be 36 it's going to be 34 and that means this isn't going to be 12 it's going to be 11.5 and 11.3 and 11.2 okay I'm, I'm not going to keep it all I lost a little tiny bit yeah, I mean, there's no other mechanics you can believe in. No one's going to draw me a picture that's a better picture than this, of, of this is how it really works. There's no other way it can work. This is how it works. And there's no room in there for any velocity squared business. <sighs> Whatever. All right, so now we'll call it a video. I think. Pretty much. All right, so till the next time and such, this has been the Draft Science Video Presentation and such.